You're listening to Searching for More, a podcast of the Diocese of Arlington. On this episode, Lieutenant Colonel Rory Quinn, U.S. Marine Corps Marine Representative in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, talks about the parallels between military service and living your faith, and how his faith has sustained him through 23 years of service as a Marine. The phrase I use is just endure. Hear Lieutenant Colonel Quinn's compelling story of faith and service. This episode's host is Billy Atwell, Chief Communications Officer of the Diocese. Lieutenant Colonel Rory Quinn, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Happy to be here. Thank you. So uh, to give people a little bit of introduction before we get into your story, um, you know, where do you where do you go to Mass? Where, you know, where are you from? Where are you living? Sure. So I live actually on base in Quantico, the Marine base down there. Triangle is the town right outside the base. Right. And St. Francis of Assisi Parish is down there. So family attend services there. And then all three of my kids actually go to two of them to the parish school and one of them to the preschool that's in the church building. He'll He'll go to the parish school in a couple of years. Very cool. So you're uh, you're a Marine. How long have you been in the Marine Corps? For 23 years and a few months. All right. And how long have you been at, at Quantico in the capacity you're in now? Presently, uh, two years. Okay. Like a lot of Marines, you go and you come back to Quantico through the course yeah. of your career. I think this is my fourth time back. Uh, but two years presently, I did four years a bit ago, three years before that, one year before that. Right. So right now you're at the uh, you're the Pentagon, and I've got here that you're a Marine representative for the Office of the Secretary <laughs> of Defense, focused on best practices in close combat. Yeah. So it's a mouthful. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the Office of the Secretary of Defense Close Combat Lethality Task Force is the name of my team. In other okay. words, CCLTF. What I describe to people is um, CCLTF. It's an effort by the SecDef to try to look for the best practices that exist anywhere. For example in how we manage aviation units. You can imagine as someone who flies on commercial aircraft, military aircraft are managed very procedurally, very robustly for obvious reasons. Right. Um, And we want the ground forces, in other words, your son or daughter could join the infantry or any other MOS, but my job is to look at how the infantry is managed in the Army, the Marines, and in the Special Operations Command, and try to mimic those best practices of correctly managing aircraft. Well, you know, imagine managing the infantry of people, uh, that they get the correct schools, that they have the correct experience, so that if your son is an 18-year-old and he goes overseas as the junior member of a rifle squad, which is the base, right. it's the equivalent of a single aircraft rifle squad, it's the base unit, you want him to have the most experience and best leadership, subordinate leaders in between the top dog and him who have the correct training and experience. It's basically that. We do all manner of things to en- enhance the completeness and the robustness of infantry training and capability. And what, what, how do you define close combat? What is that? How does the military, maybe the re- Marine Corps defines it differently than others, but how do you define no, that? Uh, you know, that's an interesting point. When we started, there were a degree of different uh, definitions, which sometimes can lead to problems. Again, if an yeah. aviation mishap had happened and if you had heard that different people called different things, that would you could see a, mm-hmm. a problem. The way that we define it is... Um, infantry combat that occurs within line of sight of the opposing force. So you can see the enemy that you're fighting. In the modern context, you add the drone aspect. So you may not see them with your eyeballs, but you see them with something that you're controlling. You have an iPad or an equivalent in your lap. You control the drone, you see what's happening. And then to borrow some manly sounding phrases from the Marine Corps lexicon, you then with that force, you would close with and destroy those guys yeah. through either maneuvering on them or through, you know, eventually hand-to-hand combat, although that does rarely happen. Yeah. So it's it's a, a proud military thing to have a common definition, but I know it can sound either hyper-masculine or, you know, <laughs> oh, that's brutal to a civilian audience. Uh, well, it sounds pretty cool job. either way. <laughs> yeah. So, but you did not grow up in a military family, is that right? I did not. So um, how did you get into it? You know, I like to tell people because I sort of don't like um, maybe drama. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have a dramatic answer to that question. The answer is it was a great way to pay for college. Yeah, uh, I was. It's a good answer. I mean, it's a real answer, right? Um, I frankly, I saw Top Gun in 1986 when I was <laughs> what in sixth grade. I wanted to be a Navy pilot. Um, skip a few steps just for length, and I find myself at Boston University. I'm in the ROTC, the Navy ROTC mm-hmm. program. Then I got sort of intoxicated with the very personal meaning kneecap to kneecap, like we're sitting here uh, right. directly across from each other, flavor of human interaction and leadership that are in a lot of the other MOSs, the military job fields, when I say MOS. 
And as I got more familiar with that, I realized the infantry seemed like the hardest thing to do. I kind of surprised myself that I liked that a lot. You know, I might have described myself in the past as someone who was comfortable being comfortable. Mm -hmm. But as you get acculturated to the initial training in, in any military service, uh, at least in my case, I realized, actually, that's really hard. And I really like that. Um, so. So when you've looked, so you've been doing it for 23 years. So that's what got you in. 23 years later, what's what's kept you in? Uh, well, I'll give you another stock answer I tell a lot of people because people <laughs> ask at this time. But there's three yeah. things that keep me in. First is I just love being a Marine. Yeah. And that's maybe a hard answer here because if you don't know exactly what a Marine is, the point is I love my profession. I love uh, the daily activities that I do. I love what the service highlights, what is important within the culture, et cetera. Um, the second reason I like it is because it's very relevant. I was a history major, for example. I love history. And at various points in my career, uh, I have felt like I'm living history. I mean, and that applies to many thousands of Americans doing things like what I do and, and doing exactly what I do. Many of us are very relevant in the present tense in, in something that you can conceive will be studied in, in the future. Yeah. Um, I don't suffer for lack of uh, wondering if I make a difference is, is yeah. the answer, you know. And the third reason I stay, uh, some ways this is the main reason I stay right now, is I have three children, all boys, 10, 9, and 4. And as I mentioned, I live on base. It is like a slice of the 1950s on a military base. I know every one of my neighbors. Now, I may not be super close friends with every single person, but I know every last name of every house I can see when I walk out my front door. That's completely different from what it's been like when I live in, quote unquote, normal America. You know, some tours in the past I have lived in what we call town. Um, my kids run free on base. They, I mean, there's playground outside my house, just like outside many houses. But when I was living in a, a city, I, I put a playhouse in my backyard because that's as far as I was willing to let my kids go out of yeah. my line of sight. As it is, they will just roam, you know, not, not two neighborhoods over, but they'll roam two football fields down the street. And it's not only completely safe feeling, but the other ladies or the husbands will text me or text my wife and say, hey, boy just showed up. Uh, so it's a very uh, productive environment for young kids to have that unsupervised or semi-unsupervised exploration type of activity and et cetera. It's, it's really great. I enjoy yeah. that. I would imagine Quantico is fairly safe. It's a pretty good neighborhood, I hear. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> of course, my wife's a social worker, uh, so I, we have a sense of the evils that you know exist in any place That's uh, true. in society. Yeah. But the point is, it feels very safe to the kids. Yeah. It is certainly safer than some other circumstances. Right. And it's just a lot of camaraderie. It's a very tight uh, community. Uh, over these 23 years, how much time have you had to spend overseas? I have... Uh, in a non-combat sense, you know, when we just do the normal, we call it, say, force rotations, I've deployed on two um, ship-borne deployments. So Marines will go out for six or seven months at a time on a usually a trio of three ships. So a lot, oftentimes those are to the Mediterranean or the Western Pacific. I did two med floats uh, many years ago, and then I went to uh, Okinawa, which is in Jap uh, an island in Japan, for a year, um, then three times to Iraq. And that's what six. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you you're from New York originally. Is this right? I was born in the Bronx. Okay. Uh, which is the northernmost borough, yeah. north of Manhattan. And I lived there till I was ten. Then I moved just north of there to Southern Westchester County, a town called Hastings on Hudson. Okay. And you were stateside when nine eleven happened. Is that correct? I was. I had uh, just gotten back from that year in Okinawa, um, and I was working in Quantico. That was one of those prior tours. And uh, in fact, I was teaching a, um, I don't know, just imagine, we call it a sand table exercise. Just imagine like a, um, a game of army men where you lay army men out a, around a little sandbox and then you have the student talk through what he would do if this happened or that happened. Uh, so it was, you know, dramatic seeming. Uh, the, th the sand table exercise was interrupted and everyone was told to go back to your barracks. And, um, you know, we walked over to the place where the beers are served after hours, like the lounge, mm -hmm. um, and sure, because that's where the TVs were. And yeah, sure enough, I got to watch it, you know, 20 minutes delayed or whatever. What was the atmosphere like with, you know, so you're around all military men and women. What was the atmosphere when that was all happening? The towers are, you know, first tower comes down, second yeah. tower comes down, and there's still this great unknown. What's the atmosphere and the mood like? You know, I know enough from having answered this question before to say the following thing, uh, so I don't throw you off. Um, I have a very clinical 
maybe worldview or a way of looking at things. I, I can describe why, and I don't think it's uncommon in, in many professions. I imagine the heart surgeon must be the same way. You, It's just the thing you do. It's a clinical yeah. sort of dispassionate series of actions that you have to do in what otherwise would be very high intensity, you know, heart surgery circumstances. So um, the answer to your question is it, it certainly bothered me. I'm from New York. Uh, in fact, yeah. my, my aunt worked in the building next door. Nothing happened to her. Um, I, I describe it as it just uh, hurt my feelings. You know, that's not maybe an appropriately profound um, answer, right? But what, what definitely wasn't the case was it wasn't like um, that changed my scope of my path in life. It didn't, in my case, it didn't motivate me to join the Marines. I was already one. Right. But, I mean, I love hearing stories like that um, when somebody was on one path and then that completely puts them on another path. But the way I describe it to people is both my parents were teachers, for example. And so imagine this. I'm going to tell you a story that's not true and it will seem ridiculous. Imagine if you decide you want to be a teacher and so you join a teaching program in whatever college. As part of that, you're going to be a teacher's assistant for a period of time while you're also taking academic classes over here. The teaching assistant part is like the lab mm -hmm. to, to complement the main part, which is your academic learning. Well, at the end of the program, imagine if, here's where we go off track, you then got a job and you were a teaching assistant. And then you did that for several years and then you were got promoted to be a teacher assistant of a larger class. The point is, what sounds odd about that is when are you going to be a teacher, right? And, and what I tell people, and I take pains to say, it's not like it's a uh, some sort of psychosis or a bloodthirsty thing, but Men and women who join the military usually do so with some idea of what can happen. Right. Um, certainly in those days, I didn't expect a country to go to war and be at war for a generation. But there is a degree of when you train for war. In other words, the whole first four years of my career, three years in a battalion where I went to those two deployments I was describing in the Mediterranean. Um, and then the one year on Okinawa, which is near Korea and there's near in your training and, and you don't actually ply your trade. And so uh, I think any of us would be lying if, if we said that in those days there wasn't a degree of excitement like, yeah. okay, we're going to go see, I'm going to test my skills. Right. Uh, you will often hear that in a recruiting office. Someone say, I want to join the Marine Corps because I want to test myself in the forges of you know, recruit training or test myself, they'll say, in combat, but they don't know what that means yet. The point is, in the beginning, I was fairly clinical in my outlook of, all right, well, maybe this will happen. Um, what I will tell you is stereotypical, though. Uh, what I will tell you is sort of I had the exact same experience as some Hollywood script. You might expect whatever is the answer is. Um, many of us who, who go, then once you experience that, then it's straight out of a, a, a screenplay. I never want to experience that again. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, uh, there's a case for male bravado, whether the Marine is male or female, but a, a traditionally masculine type of jockery bravado uh, but it's it's uniformly just very high pressure and very difficult even if you're not in a bunch of firefights even if things aren't blowing up around you the the day-to-day -day, um, completing a series of actions that you've been assigned and, and staying on task and not getting pulled off task by it could be administrivia you know just mm -hmm. oh there's no more plywood so how can we do our engineer jobs that's really hard uh, yeah and so then especially if you throw in bombs and bullets um this is why nobody wants to do it again. You know, now, <laughs> yeah. now if I could serve till 40 years, I would, and I would hope that I would do nothing but Mediterranean deployments if it were an option. Right, you know? yeah. So you were, um, you served in Iraq soon after 9-11, is that right? I had a couple years delay because I had just checked into a teaching duty. Um, okay. All Marines go through uh, the basic school, and then infantry Marines go through a place called the Infantry Officer Course. In other words, the, perf the MOS-specific school. Right. So I was a teacher in those two schools. So I didn't go until May of 2004. How does, so when you did go and you, you'd been there for a while, how does that experience, maybe it deepens, maybe it stresses, I don't know, your faith life. And, and maybe for other Marines too, you, you've obviously been in a leadership position, so you've witnessed far more than just yourself in, in these situations. But mm -hmm. um, what is the religious experience like, especially for Christians or Catholics? So it's a great question. I have a feeling my answers might surprise people how broad or maybe how generic they are. Meaning, um, let me just describe again for a moment why I loved the Marine Corps. I did not come from a traditionally military family. I found out after I joined that a few of my relatives did four years here or there, but I didn't know that when I was in high school. 
Um, I loved the Marine Corps because of the, the camaraderie that was present in being associated with a large group of people doing something in concert. In other words, if it's not obvious yet, watch the parallel to the church, right? Mm-hmm. Or, or to any other thing. Maybe if I joined a very large a school district and there was a, you know, multiple ages, uh, sects of ages inside the teacher's yeah. lounge. But my point is, if I talk about the, the military, it's I just thrived towards the challenge. I thrived towards the difficulty of understanding certain things. Um, it's very common in the training pipeline. Again, think you're a private or a second lieutenant uh, who's not even a lieutenant yet. You're in officer candidate school. Um, you are living like on the bottom of the pond. You know, you're a, a little guy, a little tadpole, and there are these uh, giants in your community, whether they're drill instructors or the colonel or the general, the sergeant major. Um, there's a whole ecosystem you're inside of. Well, guess what? In the beginning, you get told what to do, but you don't have it explained to you. So in the beginning, you just mimic the actions of those around you. When you don't have an understanding of why you march or why do we shave each day, why do we wear the same color socks, shirts, a lot of it seems ridiculous, frankly, when you don't have the context. But it's the middle manager's jobs to remove from you the idea of applying judgment to those small details. Now, you know, some super dramatic thing happens, you're expected to apply judgment. But in the details of your daily life, you just do. Um, And you have to have faith as you're a private, as you're a second lieutenant, in your leadership, you have to have faith that these things that you're being made to do, this is how you spend your days doing these various tasks. Every Thursday night in barracks all over the world, soldiers, Marines, airmen, they clean the barracks. They, they wax the floors. You know, I used to iron my uniform all the time before we went to a style of uniform that gets ironed less. I, I, did, I thought that was odd that a Marine was ironing. But the, <laughs> the, se- the seniors didn't because they understood that it was establishing discipline. It was establishing attention to detail. It was, you know, a method of demonstrating instant obedience to orders, including if the orders change. Let's, now, this didn't happen, but let's say they wanted it ironed in a different way the next day. Well, then you would do it. What would happen often is they would change some of the, say, reactions to what you're supposed to do if you get a pretend ambush, like a training ambush. You know, this other force is ambushing me with blank rounds. Well, on Monday, you may respond this way. If you get other orders on Tuesday, then on Wednesday, you're supposed to respond a different way. Those are all things that you do. The, the tie-in is I had faith in my superiors, just like I have faith in the leaders of the church, um, and I did what they said. And after a period of time in the Marines, I all of a sudden had an aha moment and I realized maybe a, a dawning realization in the beginning, but it soon became a full-blown realization of why we do all those things. Yeah, I'm now in a more senior position. Let's just say I'm 10 years in at that point. Now I understand, I, maybe I've studied a unit next door that had a big mishap. And in the investigation, they described that a breakdown in discipline, a breakdown in the connecting actions of humans communicating to humans in common terms. You know, I mentioned Earlier, we defined close combat in a common way. That's important, right? Uh, that led to the, the crash or the mistake, the combat death. I'm sorry, the training death. Well, the next day in your own unit, you're, you're striving with, I mean, unbelievable effort to get all those connecting actions correct. Mm-hmm. And, and let's be honest, most Sundays at some point in the morning before I go to church, there's a, a moment, if not an hour, where I don't want to go that day. I'll go right. to the 1130. I'll go to the, you know. Uh, well, that's no different than just bearing through and getting through the discomfort or the lack of organization in the house. You can't find the child's shoes. Um, you just go because you go. It's not more complex. You go because that's what you do. And so there's a lot of correlations between probably any large organization. But in the military in particular, you do a lot of seemingly senseless stuff in the beginning. And later you understand there's a rhyme and a reason to all of it. Um, it's the opposite now. I sit in church and I struggle with certain elements of faith. Now I'm reflecting back on the military learning and saying, oh, well, I knew what the reason for that is later. And now I understand the third order effect of that initial thing. I wonder if there's a third order effect of this thing I'm confused about. I wonder if I'm on the second evolution of thought where when I get to the third evolution of thought, that's when I'll have my aha moment with uh, an item of faith. How did you deal when you were in the military and, you know, you're you're not as green as you once when you start realizing that these leaders that you might have almost, you know, idolized at points Mm -hmm. are flawed? or they have weaknesses that, you know, could bear great consequence. How did, how do you respond? Because, of course, there's a natural parallel to the church, right, and sure. some of the crisis we're in and things, that, you know, the, the mistakes were made and, and they did things yeah. that were maybe just even dishonorable. Right. How do you handle Does that shake at all your, your 
belief in the in the Marine Corps and the system that you're talking about? Yeah, I chuckled when you first started saying this because my initial thought was, how do I react when I realize my superiors are flawed? Um, you have that chronologically out of order. I, <laughs> I realized myself that I was doing a bad job, let's say a year prior to this moment years ago, at some simpler thing. So by the time I get to the, the point exactly what you described, um, I think most self-reflexive people, or at least people with a, a normal amount of humility, you start to see your own flaws. You should start to see your own flaws long before you rise to a level where you can credibly observe massive flaws. I mean, you're talking about something on the order of massive flaws, right? Of My ego has never allowed that in myself, by the uh, well, way. I was so saying that's why others. I have no idea what you're talking about. I was saying for others. For, for, for instance, the guys, the guys back in the booth, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but even that, like the self-deprecating humor is, I, I love that it's part of uh, the military. Mm -hmm. You hear self-deprecating humor I mean, if it's not in every homily, you certainly hear it one out of every four, right? <laughs> and in, in the other three out of four, you hear a different style of humor, whether it's comparison to something absurd or, I mean, it's just a very camaraderie type of way. But before I get off, off track, um, here's the answer I give to that question. I mean, I can cite names that you know from, from world events and right. say, oh, you know what? Not only can I say that person did something that's wrong in my view, I can oftentimes say, I've been in that person's presence when they've brought up things they've done wrong. In fact, a lot of times I get brought along, uh, similar to how a priest will coach during mass. Um, you know, we, we have meetings with these people and I'm, I'm a middle manager now, but, but as you go through your, your formal periods, let's say you were to go to a civilian, you go to like a six week sales course. Well, we have one year long worth of school a couple of times in your career, like a master's degree uh, program type of thing. They bring in speakers, I mean, all manner from, from, the chairman of Joint Chiefs all the way down. And and uh, depending on which schools you're going to, some of them are high-ranking civilian political. They're very frank in these um, meetings, most times. I mean, some of them, if they have a, a larger ego than the others, they may talk less. But then the students will ask questions, you know. So what I end up saying to people is this. Um, first of all, the military, the church, the teachers' lounge that I was referring to, they're, they're organizations of humans. So, so what is it that you expect, right? right? The question, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, but this question when it's posed to me, I mean, what is the alternative? If, you, if you've got the line on perfection, right, then sign me up. I'll yeah. come over, yeah. right? If, if the church isn't too far from my house, that, right. that's, that's a joke. But, um, <laughs> but I'm not sure it gets any better than some level, right? Yeah. However, you always strive for perfection so that you make sure you're as high performing as you can be. Well, my answer there is, that's your job. In other words, um, you know, a, a crisis of character in a unit, which happens, right? A crisis of character in a parish, which happens. Um, it's bad. So I'm not saying when I say the next sentence that I'm not papering over that. Mm -hmm. But the, the next step is usually you. Often it's not because you don't do anything, right? To aggregate yeah. you. But do something. Get involved. Now, there's no reason. And I'll tell you what, I have reacted poorly on a few occasions when I felt like people were just papering over. Like in the name of future actions, let's focus on the future. That only works unless there's an acknowledgement of the present problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but, you know, for instance, in St. Francis, I, I think Father John O'Connor and his crew, they do a great job on some of those things. Uh, on they do a great job in certain occasions when I can remember on all of those things. You know, I've yeah. been very happy with just the frank acknowledgement of uh, we're Catholics and we're going to go into the future and here's what I need from you. I always kind of enjoy when the priest, he tells the funny story, as I mentioned. He has the little innuendo, uh, like on Christmas and Easter, he says, it's good to see you all. And he pauses, you know. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, but, but then I like it when he gives me a little fire and brimstone, like here's what you're going to do. You know, yeah. something in this arena, you're going to donate money, you're going to donate time, you're going to... Uh, not just do the things you do in your life, but you're going to do them with an awareness that you're an example and tell someone, I'm trying to be an example in my faith as I do this thing, whether it's taking care of your parent or working extra hard on being perfect when you build the brick wall, whatever. I mean, it, it's those elemental aspects I was describing in the Marines where seeming ridiculous things like not wearing white socks, it's a common joke in the Marines. Why does it matter? It, it matters because I said it matters. Yeah. Because later when I say charge across the street now, you don't know that I know the machine gun just ran out of ammo. If, if you start debating, don't tell me what to do. Why is <laughs> yeah. now a good time? Like I can literally watch the guy reloading and maybe you just take off six seconds later, but I don't have the time. I mean, the point is it's important because I say it's important. 
until great, you give that's up a your great moral point. authority. I mean, because seeing the big picture is a lot of the time the reason that we will not want to follow an order. You know, our priest mm-hmm. convicts us to uh, to do something or to, to change something about how we're operating within the parish, and often there's a, this feeling of, well, why? Which is kind of a childish reaction. Like, our children do that. Right. Hopefully we don't. But he's going to have a perspective that's much broader. I thought about this once when I was talking with a priest that does marriage counseling. He said, you often have to explain to them why you're encouraging them to not live together before they get married, all these mm-hmm. things. And what he doesn't have time to do is is summarize the 200 or 400 or 800 couples before them yes. that he's counseled and talked to and seen what works and doesn't work. It's not just that the church teaches it. It's that this is what's best for you. And if you wait for me to explain all of it to you, it's too late. Yeah, so you have to listen and, and just trust. So as long as he or she remains, uh, I'm sorry, maintains their moral authority, then there should be a default expectation that you listen to them blindly until they have the time to explain it or until you mature. This is the example I was saying earlier from the Marines, until you're capable of understanding the context. Yeah. So there's many things having to do, let's say, with faith, because that's how you frame this. I don't understand why I do certain things. I'm told to do them so that I do them, mm-hmm. say when I'm 25. And then, for instance, a common example would be when a person has children or when you become married. Uh, I used to rebel when married people would say to me, well, you'll understand when you're married. And when kid people with kids would say to me, you'll understand when you have kids. Because I didn't like being in a position of information inferiority. Yeah. Now, if they were egotists, don't, don't, don't take that as the example. If they were even headed level-headed people and they were just saying this because it's a fact well guess what i got married and then i started to look at things different and that was a humbling experience because i realized perhaps i should have given them a bit more of the benefit of the doubt back then then i had children and certainly that changed my perspective you know i go up and rank in the marines i see broader it changes my perspective so at this point where i describe myself as mid-career um i've had enough occasions in the past where i realized that my prior self should have listened more carefully that now, for example, if a priest who's never been married, right, because that's what's in the person's mind. Right? right, yeah. If he says, well, you ought to consider this, and have you ever considered that? I, by now, I'm trained myself to just accept it and say, aha, okay, yes, let's evaluate the idea for its merits. Uh, but there would have been a time in the past when I had to say actively, well, give him the benefit of the doubt, because remember that other time when I, mm-hmm. and when I was more and more in, uh, immature, I would have said, what does he know? So, right. you know, you're in a space today and just as you walk around your place of work, there's someone who's the most mature and, and developed of your guys and, and the least. And you have to you have to maintain the moral authority, but also the um, the awareness to know that you have to speak to the, the most immature one a little different. You have to bring in the most mature one, the most capable, probably delegate more to that person so they feel like their team. I mean, this is the process of getting more capable in your career and yeah. skill set, right? So you've be, you you benefit now in that you've got a, a parish with a priest and you know kind of that normal parish life, but you've mm-hmm. served a lot and you've been in positions where you were overseas and didn't have that, but you had a chaplain yes. maybe available to well, talk about the role of a chaplain and how that has worked in your faith. So this is a funny story. Um, I, I need to give just the slightest bit of a common baseline between us for life in the infantry. Okay, um, first of all the chaplains that serve in marine units are all navy officers so the marines don't have a chaplain corps okay our, all of our chaplains come from the navy the marines are part of the navy all of our surgeons come from the navy all of our uh what an army would call medic the marines call corpsmen so they come from the navy there's certain job fields including priests there are no marine priests there's navy priests so the chaplain is a navy officer which is going to be important to the story and the little bit of a baseline in the infantry is that the infantry is a very um brutal sort of Spartan existence. It's a cruel reality, Uh, sometimes just because you're hiking over sharp rocks and so your feet hurt and such. But, you know, it you don't you can't carry an air conditioner with you. So you're hot. You can't carry the maybe the food you want or the food. It's harder to get the food to you hot. So you eat cold food a lot. Your your staff was laughed when I asked for black coffee and and I gave him the answer, which is an infantry answer, which is I didn't like it at first. The reason I drink black coffee is because I can have it the same regardless. <laughs> I, it's not dependent on whether there's creamer in the, yeah. the center or sugar in the common operation center. I can just have it black every time coffee's available. That's why I drink black coffee. It's an infantry thing. Right. So in this very Spartan, brutal, almost purposefully cruel existence, 
for camaraderie, I, I hope I explained it right, the, there's a tightness that derives from shared suffering, you know, not true suffering like you're starving, right, but just doing difficult things together. And so you thrive on it. You actually like hope it rains. For, that's a true thing. Um, totally not while it's happening. But after it's over, you loved that it rained. After you're dry again, you love that rain. You're telling the unit next door how weak they are because they, they could do the same thing you did, but not during the rain. Yeah. Well, into that environment, imagine, and I say this in the, the purest form of jest, but you know, this is infantry humor. Into that Spartan, lean environment walks a cherubic, um, little doughy chaplain. You know what I mean? <laughs> like like uh, just a person that is not of the infantry, right? <laughs> right, right. In, in his makeup and his, his daily activities and such. Um, fully participating in everything the battalion does now. But the point I'm making is that gunnery sergeant's been doing this 18 years. Mm -hmm. You've been part of the unit 10 months, chaps. You know, right. like good for keeping up, but there's a, just a difference between the gunny and you, right? And so you would expect, and I could provide examples, I won't here. I could provide examples of other outsiders who approach infantry units and are universally shunned, you know what I mean? Yeah. Who are, are poked at, and maybe if they can take a joke, then after they demonstrate the capability, then they're, Included again. I mean, the goal is is to have a cohesive unit. But um, trust me, if you trip uh, as an infantryman, like walking on flat ground, it, you're going to hear about it for a week. Right? <laughs> so, so in that venue, a person like the chaplain should be uh, almost the hardest to break in. He's got all the navy jokes that I'm not making now, but you know, you can imagine right. them. And <laughs> he would make the marine ones back and stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, I had 186 marines with me in in, for instance, this tour you're talking about in Ramadi, Iraq. Then. Ramadi was the name of the city. Mm -hmm. And um, I would say a solid 36, 20%, uh, give or take, a, you know, however off I am for accuracy. A solid 30, 40 Marines just revered this chaplain, right? He would come around. So as was common and is common today in Afghanistan, in Iraq those days, we, we just had separate bases. So we had, let's just say five bases for five companies. It was a little bit different than that, but close enough. So I had one base, one company, separate from the other places. Well, the chaps would come around, and it was like the Pied Piper had rolled in, you know, and the, the men started to flock. Um, now, I had been with these guys for a year, training with them, doing all manner of things. I guess when you sit and think about it, most Sundays I wasn't with them. Some Sundays I was, because sometimes we'll do 10 days worth of training from a Monday to the next Thursday. But part of this is I didn't typically see everything they did on Sundays, part of this story. The other part, though, is... I'm convinced, okay, 18 of them went to church all the time. Um, 36, though, were going then. And, you know, I could have the ratios off. Maybe there's a bunch of others. Like me, I'm, I'm kind of a private religious guy. Mm -hmm. Like I don't often, I know this is odd to say, I'm on a podcast here, but I don't, on a generic day, start telling people all the details, what's in my head. So I just want to talk about these 36, whether they were the most religious or the most mm -hmm. uh, fearful. But the point is they flocked to the chaplain. And they had, he had a, an assistant with him, a religious program specialist. We call him RP, religious program. The RP was even more atypical to thrive in the infantry. But, you know, he was a junior enlisted man, the RP, whereas the chaplain was probably 35-year-old officer. The Marines flocked even more, I want to say violently. It was that, it, I mean, it was, they Intently. flocked enthusiastically, yeah. Yeah. right, towards the RP. And it just seemed odd to me. But the point is, I think uh, it goes to say, first of all, some of your Marines and your teacher's assistants, your your people in your surgeon's office, any walks of life, they're very religious. But um, in that environment, the the enthusiasm with which they flocked was notable. And I think it goes to, in difficult circumstances, how do people seek out healing or calmness? And in, in those cases, they sought it directly from the person of the priest. I mean, he was non-denominational, but sometimes a Catholic priest would come around. We would schedule. There would be Marines who never asked me for anything. You know, I was the captain. In my mind, one of the men, but in their mind, probably there was a great social distance between them and me, much to my disappointment. <laughs> um, but, you know, they would never ask me for anything, but they would come around and ask for a priest to come every so often, you know. So it's just a little story of the role of God in people's lives. And yeah. but that was a very present way to see it in the name of the chaplain. You know, there's a, a maxim that is attributed often to uh, Eisenhower didn't say it, but he said it in a speech um, that there's no atheists in foxholes. Yeah. Right? And so Marines would say fighting hole. We call it a fighting hole. There's no atheists in fighting holes. Um, and, you know, that's that's an example. Um, another thing, I'll just tell you this right now because I we ought to get it out at one point. People are interested to hear this, but it uh, makes me a little uncomfortable. The point is 
I, I would be lying intellectually if I didn't cover it here. You know, I didn't, for instance, seek the chaplain's services, right? I went to church you know, maybe once a month there, mostly because of tempo and we had missions going all the time. But I'm also not, that's not how I, um, in that environment, would seek it out. What I had was an internal sort of living according to principles, trying yeah. to. Uh, but what's interesting, though, is um, it's a little bit of mysticism or a little bit of, uh, you know, strict religious types of uh, interest item is a major who had been my boss prior when he knew I was going to go to Iraq. He gave me a uh, St. Michael uh, medal, you know, the little medallion on, yeah. a, on a tough chain type of thing. Um, and so I wore it the whole time I was there, you know, when you would be operating, when you would come back, even just for simplicity, just keep it on in the shower and dry it off and stuff. It never, it never uh, came off. And so people do have a wonder uh, sometimes, you know, is there something dramatic? You know, can you tell me a story? And uh, one of them is I did not choose to seek my peace through going to see the chaplain. But I'll tell you, it struck me there were maybe 10 times, maybe seven, um, when I would be out operating in the city. Uh, and it would be doing something that didn't seem to be very dramatic. For example, one that sticks with me. I had six or eight vehicles with me. I was in the second or the third one back. We're driving in a place. And the circumstances changed. We had to turn around. So it's a relatively vulnerable thing because, you know, you have a, an aggressive vehicle in the front, like with a gun on it. You maybe have your, um, if you were carrying cargo at all, that would be in the middle of the convoy. There'd be a protective vehicle in the back. Well, when you're turning around, it gets all discombobulated. And then also the protection vehicle in the back is now the aggressive vehicle when you go again. It's just uh, changing a lot. So yeah. it's a vulnerable stop. Well, I swear one time that metal Underneath my body armor, I mean, my body instead of 98.6 is probably 100.5. Everybody's is just because you're, um, well, man, if that thing didn't feel like it was 125 degrees, you know, or whatever really? number would would resonate with, it felt, vis it felt, I guess, physically like what I think visually would look like it was glowing. You know what I mean? Right. And again, it sounds awkward to say or people look at you with a cocked eye when you're, but um, I definitely felt this is, I think, the issue of faith, is the definition of faith, right? I had no reason that made any sense to believe that it was, first of all, anything. It was probably just a figment of my imagination, or I had shifted like this, and there had been yeah. more friction. But that's not what I felt. What I felt was that there was a protection on me at that moment. In other words, a lot of bombs are buried underneath the pavement. It's not like I was getting shot at, but the bullets were going around my head like the Matrix. They were bending. Not, nothing yeah. that's traditionally as dramatic as that. But I certainly felt seven or ten times that deployment in general, but specifically the metal would just get hotter than uh, normal. And it was very comforting. I mean, like I wouldn't need to go to church two months after one of those things happened. <laughs> I wouldn't need to, right? Yeah. Because the sense of being protected, and not at the expense of someone else, like there was some enemy that didn't win, but I won and he's going. Right, right. It was just keeping the, the calm in a turbulent period. Uh, one of the Marines didn't panic because say a bomb had gone off. And then, I mean, sometimes you can just crash a vehicle, roll a vehicle. There have been Marines killed from non-shrapnel related, just rollovers and stuff. It's, it's dangerous, right? So yeah. um, it was such a sort of generic thing. I mean, it wasn't dramatic. There was not a lightning bolt came, but I, I felt a definite sense of, you know, a protector. Um, yeah. So if you, if you had a, a young man that had, you know, just joined the Marines and let's say he's going to get deployed and he's going to a, a war zone, it's not going to be good. And you've been in those places and know what that life is like mm -hmm. in terms of sustaining his faith life. He's going to obviously have questions about just living as a deployed Marine and your family back home. He's going to have questions like that. But on the topic of faith, what would be your advice or your recommendation for uh, a young Marine in that scenario? Well, I mean, if you give me the young Marine scenario, I could probably give you a hundred recommendations, things like become proficient in your job. Uh, you're at that phase where you're supposed to just do and not question why. Evaluate your leaders. See if they have the moral authority and the professional competence. But you'll quickly realize they do and then obey. Uh, but I mean on topics of faith. You know, how do you sustain sure. your faith in that? that right. So I'm, I'm trying to make that parallel again. Uh, if you don't know why you're doing things, perform them anyway. You know, oh, okay, if yeah. you don't understand the, uh, for instance, here's a, here's a almost stereotypical anguish of a deployed soldier is what is it all for? You know, mm. uh, my friend was just killed yesterday and I'm told to go do the same type of mission, oftentimes even on the same terrain. I mean, literally the same street if you were in a uh, urban scenario or the same um, thousand meter square area if you're in a, 
The answer is because I say to go. Now, that sounds like the military obey, right? But go forth and do good things. You know, have an impact on others. Uh, the, the phrase I use, and I, I feel it needed a bit of setup, the phrase I use is just endure. Now, that sounds maybe uninspiring, but my point is it's foolish. It's a fool's errand to try to figure out so much info that you'll understand exactly what's going on and your role in it, right? Whether it's in Ramadi or whether it's in church. Um, you should just learn that you will realize the cause of it. And you'll realize the, you'll understand your faith at the time when it's appropriate for you to do so. Now that some people say that's snake oil salesman, that you're entitled to believe that. And don't, you know, tell me that again. Like I'll just associate away from you. But I believe that that's your role. I believe that's your job. There's many people who are, um, you know, leading the congregation. And there's many people who put a dollar in the plate. And that's also quite important. If you ask the guy who's leading the congregation, he might prefer a hundred dollars, yeah. but, uh, but you're, you're pulling the boat. I mean, you're rowing the boat, right? Yeah. So there's nobility, not that the goal is to suffer, but I would tell him, look, you're going to suffer, but there's nobility in suffering and carrying on. That's yeah. the, where the nobility is, is carrying on unaffected. Um, the goal is that you will achieve either military victory or you will achieve spiritual understanding, you'll achieve life victory. But along the way, you're going to have road bumps and you're going to suffer. Just endure, just press on. Mm. That's what I would, that's not only what I would tell people, that's what I do tell people. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Well, is there anything I didn't ask that I should have, anything I should have dug into that we didn't get into? Uh, you know, it, from having similar conversations, I'll, uh, could, I, could I give you a second shot at maybe what I w would tell a person? How about yeah. this, a person under stress? Because yeah. um, as I've mentioned, I'm not brimming with, religion out of my mouth all the time. But, mm -hmm. um, but this is what I use in, in eulogies, which unfortunately, all, all of us, I mean, everybody goes to eulogies. Um, there may be more frequent in the military. Um, but I got a good reaction off of this one the first time I told it. And so it's stuck with me. The point is, um, I think this is an analogy for life. And so it's, it's from Mark chapter four. It's a story of when um, the seas became choppy and Jesus calmed the seas, right? I might embellish it a bit in the way that I think it needs to be understood for those circumstances. But the point is, a, a violent thing has happened yesterday, uh, something that we can't control, and it's causing great duress, right? Um, if you think about the story, and then especially for the slice of people who primarily draw their strength from parables or Bible stories, this is going to resonate great, but it's generic enough, it's general enough, it can apply to just a tough time in your job. And the answer is, in my phrases, that the trip on the boat becomes dangerous because Jesus has been teaching all day. That's a key part. And so he's tired, right? The, the boat story starts with the seas, but don't lose sight. He's tired because he's been preaching all day and teaching. And so he's sleeping in the, you know, back of the boat and the uh, apostles get nervous and they think the boat's going to capsize and they look and each time they look, he's still sleeping, right? Um, in my mind, filling in between the lines of the scripture, they become angry. They start to resent, uh, I think, as I try to imagine what would have actually been occurring and in, in the economy of words, you can't relate all this. Um, they're getting angry. And then they finally say, wake up. Like, it's obvious we need you. All sorts of parallels to your boss, to the captain, to et cetera. Right. Um, and even though the first words Jesus speaks are about the water, um, he says to quiet, be still that's to the waves. In my mind, they're to the people. You know, like it's almost like he looks slightly over their shoulder. So technically he's looking at the water. He says, quiet down, right? Be still, the water calms. And I think continuing his, his talk to the humans, he said, you know, why are you so upset? Like, do you not have faith? And the, the point is that the water's choppy to you, right? You're, you're nervous. He's obviously not, he's still sleeping. Well, he's unaware. Well, no, that's not the point of the story. He's not unaware whether you believe it's a formal test of faith or you just believe he's really tired. Um, either way, it wasn't decisive, was it? You didn't sink, did you? But you thought you were gonna. And so you can imagine you point to a mother in a crowd, you point to a sergeant whose other sergeant the previous day has undergone a very violent death. Um, there's a fix coming. It's just not on your time schedule, you know? Yeah. And in fact, it's, I don't even shy away from the directiveness of it. If you, if you, God, this sounds very 
awkward to do, but I'm going to do it because it's how I think of it. I think when we watch movies, we imagine ourselves as the main character, you know, in times. And when you read about the Bible, you imagine yourself as if you're Jesus, like for a moment, you know, or you imagine, could I do what he did? Yeah. The point is, not only does he act, but he says, quiet down. Like, not just, oh, Johnny, it's okay. You know, and <laughs> right. it, it, there's a directedness, like, I've got this, and you don't rate maybe at this point in your journey, to understand all the context of it, whether you can wear white socks, green socks, you're going to do what I say because I say to do it. Now, as long as I maintain the moral authority, you trust me, which is my job to make sure I maintain it. Just do what I'm telling you. I'll handle that other thing. And then sure enough, he handles the other thing. Um, you know, frankly, the first time I told a story, I just needed a story. I needed to find something that was related. But I got such a good reaction that I have used it more generally since. Yeah. Um, you either believe that there's a fix coming, in other words, you have faith, or you don't, but there's no proof either way. If you believe yeah. there's a fix coming, you're just believing. You're not going to receive intermediate feedback like, wink, wink, you're right. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if you can really embrace it, I don't care what the waters look like, just shut your mouth and row. Yeah. You know, endure, right? Yeah. And trust that God or your commander or the superintendent of the school system, you fill in the blank, will arrive at the moment they're prepared to arrive. Maybe it's later than they need to arrive, but just in time. I said, the point is, you don't get to know. And uh, I mean, I, I certainly use that as my shut up and color type of <laughs> approach to life. Right? Well, this is, that's, that's a great way to end it, too. <laughs> but uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming in and, and sharing your story with us. And thank you so much for your service. You've given a lot to this country, and we're so grateful for it. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. You're listening to Searching for More. If you enjoyed this podcast, please write a review on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Also, make sure you follow the Diocese and the Arlington Catholic Herald on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe to our YouTube channels for regular videos that inspire, educate, and inform about the Catholic faith in our diocesan community.